So let's look back at limits. It's been a while since we thought about limits. We used them to eventually come up with the graph of, excuse me, the idea of a derivative. But let's look at limits like this one. Limit as x approaches 0 of uh, the sine of x over x. Now, just as a reminder, I mean, we've got a final exam that's weeks away at this point, but it doesn't hurt to think about things. As a reminder, when you try and evaluate a limit, what's the first thing you always go for? Plug in, plug in the limit, sure. And if you plug in the limit, you get uh, 0 over 0. Yeah. 0 over 0 is undefined. I can literally make 0 over 0 anything I want, depending on my choice of functions here. So if you get 0 over 0, you can't cancel and get 1. 0 over 0 is something called an indeterminate form. Likewise, if you get infinity over infinity, that's another indeterminate form. So if you end up with something like this, then there's hope. There's something called L'Hopital's Rule. Now, the way that most books that I've ever seen spell it is without the S. Now, if you want to spell it with the S, eh, that's fine. I used to literally give an extra credit question. and This used to be part of Calc 2. I give an extra credit question to spell L'Hopital's name with the correct pronunciation. And there's a little hat here for L'Hopital. In any case, what does L'Hopital's Rule say? Well, L'Hopital's Rule says that... Um, if you have differentiable functions, and if your limit ends up to be something like this, this one here, or this one here, and the plus or minus doesn't matter, so it could be plus infinity or minus infinity, if it ends up being one of these forms, then this is what's true. The limit as x approaches your value of f of x over g of x is going to have the same limit as if you took the derivative of the numerator and the derivative of the denominator. And a lot of times that can make a world of difference. Let me give you kind of a quick example here with the one that we put up to start this. And that is this one right here. The sine of 0 is 0. And as x approaches 0, x goes to 0. So this fits this pattern, 0 over 0. And I can't just plug that in, so what I'll do is I'll differentiate each part of this. I'll differentiate the numerator, and I'll differentiate the denominator. The important thing to realize is that when you're using L'Hopital's rule, you're not applying the quotient rule to this. So what's the derivative of the numerator? Cosine. And I need a brave volunteer to give me the derivative of the denominator. One, thank you for your bravery. All right, awesome. Now, let's try and take the limit again. As x approaches zero, where is this going? Cosine of zero over one. Yeah, one over one, which is one. Now in calc one, to solve this without L'Hopital's rule, you have to use the sandwich theorem. You have to come up with some crazy upper and lower bounds and then show that they're going to the same place. It's a real pain. This is a two-liner now. This is a lot easier than it would be without L'Hopital's rule. So that's really cool. So to kind of get started with this, though, we're going to practice something that is, um, is, is what you're going to have to work with, and that is looking at stuff like this and deciding you know, does, does this fall into an indeterminate form? Now, there are more indeterminate forms, but if you're going to use L'Hopital's rule, it has to be one of these forms. It has to be 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. You have to make it look like this in order to apply L'Hopital's rule. Sometimes you can do that even if you're starting out with something like this. So let's take a look at these things. You've got all these different limits. And the question is, does L'Hopital rule apply? Is it an indeterminate form, yes or no? So let's take a look. Limit as x approaches a of f of x over g of x. 
Is that an indeterminate form, yes or no? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That one matches, so we're good there. Because you got 0 over 0. Let's try the next one. Limit as x approaches a of f of x over p of x. So f of x is going to 0. Where's p of x going? Infinity. So it's not an indeterminate form, but can anyone tell me what the value of this limit is? Yeah, 0 divided by any constant or infinity is going to be 0. How about this one? h of x over p of x. No. H of x is going to 1, p of x is going to infinity. Uh, it's not indeterminate, but we don't really need L'Hopital's rule. Can anyone tell me what that limit is? Negative infinity. Well, 1 divided by infinity is going to be 0. P of x over Q of x. Yes. Yes. So there you've got infinity over infinity. That is an indeterminate form. And last but not least, f of x times P of x. Well, f of x is going to 0, and P of x is going to infinity. It is is kind of an indeterminate form, but you can't use L'Hopital's rule. So it's kind of an in-between. Um, so we'll put a yes, but you can't use L'Hopital's rule just yet. So you would have to, you'd have to rewrite this a little bit in order to put it in the form of 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity, and then use L'Hopital's rule. Okay, great. So kind of a little intro problem there for you, just like what you're going to see in the homework. Let's keep cruising along with example B. Now, just because you have a limit problem doesn't mean you have to use L'Hopital's rule. So it says find the limit. Use L'Hopital's rule where appropriate. If there's a more elementary method, consider using it. So the first method, of course, would be to do what? Plug in the limit. And I'll save you some time. If you plug in the limit, you get 0 over 0. So right away, you can use L'Hopital's rule. Um, but let's consider this. The numerator is going to factor, right? The answer is yes. yes. All right, thank you. So x minus 5 times x plus 3 over x minus 5. <clears throat> I still don't want to plug in the limit, but I can do something here that I couldn't do just a minute ago. Cancel out the x minus 5s. And now I'm looking at the limit as x approaches 5 of x plus 3. And what's that limit? Eight, right? Just plug in the limit. Now you can use L'Hopital's rule here just fine. If you did did with L'Hopital's rule, it would work out perfect. Um, let's see. So let me redo it with L'Hopital's rule. So if I did it with L'Hopital's rule, then I'd be doing the derivative of the numerator and the derivative of the denominator. Philo, what's the derivative of the numerator here, please? 2x minus 2. All right, 2x minus 2 over what? 1. 1. And that's just really, oops, uh, 2x minus 2. If I plug in a 5, what do I get? Eight. Awesome. And notice that's the exact same answer that I got just above. Thanks again, Philo. They match. Great. But you don't always have to use L'Hopital's rule. Sometimes you're going to want to use L'Hopital's rule. Interestingly enough, L'Hopital did not discover the rule that bears his name. He paid uh, an early pioneer in calculus by the name of Johann Bernoulli to be his tutor. 
with the agreement that if they discovered anything, he would get to write it. L'Hopital is credited with writing one of the first ever calculus textbooks. Um, but how about down here? Let's take a look at example C. Hmm. If you try plugging in a limit, you get infinity over essentially negative infinity. So you could use L'Hopital's rule, but, you know, that's using like a, a sledgehammer to swat a fly. All right. So can anyone suggest a different way? This isn't going to factor and cancel like example B. Can anyone suggest a different way? Drew? Could you multiply x squared over x squared? Oh. I mean, divide everything by x squared? Yeah. You could. Don't they both have the same power, so you just take the coefficient? Yeah, there you go. The degrees are the same. So if the degrees are the same, do you remember what the rule was? It's just going to be the ratio of the leading coefficients. So it's going to be 1 over negative 5. And I'd probably write that, that negative uh, out front like that. So negative 1 fifth. And that's it. Now, if you wanted to, you could use L'Hopital's rule. Nothing wrong with that. But if you're going to use L'Hopital's rule, then something funny kind of happens. Um, so, uh, let's see. Um, if you use L'Hopital's rule, so let me do it over here. Example C with L'Hopital rule. So it's going to be a limit as x approaches infinity of x plus x squared over 1 minus 5x squared. Well, that gives you infinity over negative infinity. So you can use L'Hopital's rule. And let's do that below. Emmanuel. Yes. What would this look like if I used L'Hopital's rule? What's the numerator going to be? Derivative of x plus x squared? 2x. Mm, start with this one. Oh, 1 plus 2x. Okay. Sure. 1 plus 2x. And might as well do the denominator too. Um, 10x. Negative 10x. Negative 10x. Good. And then the next thing we try is we try plugging in the limit again. And the limit again gives us infinity over negative infinity. So, wow, we didn't get anywhere. Did we? What's that? Ah, we can do it again. So this is something cool about L'Hopital's rule. Is that, all right, it didn't work the first time, let's try it again. Keep going until it works. <laughs> Keep going until it works. All right. So what's the next derivative going to look like? Dean? Um, two on the top. Mm -hmm. And then negative 10 on the bottom. Cool. There's not much work to do here to calculate this limit, right? And just... Let's just put that in lowest terms, um, but you end up with the same thing we did uh, just a minute ago. So it's up to you how you would want to solve that. I mean, I think it's a little easier to do what we did, um, which is just to look at the ratio of the leading coefficients. One and negative five. Those are your leading coefficients, the ratio of that. That only works when these match. So if those match, then great. You got an easy out on that one. Let's take a look at example D. By the way, I should probably also uh, take a look at some of these graphs. I think I've got these graphed for us. Uh, that would be 
here. So let me shut this off. Um, take a look at example C. So for example C, we want to look at essentially what's the horizontal asymptote. So let me just zoom in a little bit here. And we're looking at the graph as x approaches infinity. And that should be getting close to the graph of y equals negative 1 divided by 5. And if you look here, it looks pretty good. Our graph is getting closer and closer to that line. So beautiful. Yeah, please. So does that, like, having to do that twice, does that tell us anything about the function or no? No, it's just we had to do it twice in order to get the limit. Yeah, I'm not sure that there's any more information I can glean from having to do it twice other than had to to get the limit. So it's just like a neat way you can find the limit? Yeah, that's just a really cool, convenient way you can find limits, you know. Um, yeah, and, and finding limits, uh, you know, other ways can be really, really difficult. Let's take a look at this one first. So, for example, D, uh, now... My graph is out of the picture, so if you want to reorient yourself, you can go back to the default view by hitting the house icon. And there we go. Uh, let me see. Let's bring this down a little bit. And maybe out this way. We'll take a look at the graph here. Um, we want to take a look at the limit as x approaches 0 of this function y equals e to the ninth minus 1 minus 9x over x squared limit as x approaches 0 I'm just going to write that down on my sheet here okay so it looks like the graph is getting you know as you get close to 0 it looks like it's going someplace, right? I mean, if we zoom in a little bit on this. But the problem is, right at zero, uh, can I get on it? No, not there. There we go. Just saw it for a brief second. Uh, right at zero, the graph is what? Undefined, right? So, but a little bit to the right of that, 40 point something, a little bit to the left of something, 38 point something. So it looks like it has a limit. The limit from the left and the limit from the right look like they're going to the same place. So if you did try and plug in x equals 0, you get 0 over 0. So use L'Hopital's rule. Okay. Now, when you use L'Hopital's rule, please don't use the quotient rule. This is a different type of problem. You're not finding the derivative of the whole thing. You're finding the derivative of the numerator and the derivative of the denominator. Now, being the very helpful instructor that I am, I'll give you the derivative of the denominator. You do the derivative of the numerator. All right. At least one person smiled. Maybe Joe's. Maybe this is a smile and joke too. All right, good deal. Now, when you differentiate e to the 9x, remember you got to use a chain rule. So, hmm. What's the derivative of e to the 9x going to look like? 9e to the 9x. Yeah, there you go. 9e to the 9x. Derivative of 1 is 0. Derivative of 9x is. 9. And bam. All right, so that's better. Now let's plug in the limit, right? William, what happens when I plug in the limit? The bottom is 0 and the top is 0. Yeah. So I get 0 over 0 again. So now what? Yeah. Use L'Hopital's rule again. All right. So that's going to be the limit as x approaches 0. 
And with the last one, and again with this one, I'll be helpful and I'll do the denominator for you. What's the numerator going to be? Close. Yeah. When you differentiate that much, you're going to get 9e to the 9x, but then 9 times 9 is going to give you 81e to the 9x. <sighs> All right. Now what? Plug in the limit. What happens when I plug in the limit? E to the 0 is 1 times 81 over 2. So 81 over 2 or 40.5 doesn't matter. Either way, that's your limit. Yes? Something I really didn't understand when doing was why does the 9 not become the in the numerator the first time you do it? Because it's not a polynomial function. Because it's not x to some power, it's, it's e to some power. And when you differentiate e to some power, it's the rule, let's see, let me remind you of the rule, um, <coughs> d by dx of e to the u, just e to the u times the derivative of the exponent. So you don't have to decrease this. In fact, that doesn't change at all in going from the function to its derivative. You're still going to have that term there. It's just you're going to have that additional baggage of multiplying by the derivative of the exponent. And so that's where the 9 came from. But yeah, you don't have to decrease that at all. E is really special in that regard because if, if this is any other number, I mean, remember, in general, if I had a to the u, I was differentiating that, I would have a natural log of a times a to the u times du by dx. The reason e is so special is because the natural log of that base is 1. So e is really cool in that regard. When you want to double check yourself, in fact, I strongly encourage you to double check yourself, you look at the graph. And when you zoom in, well, yeah, okay. So right here is 41. Here's 40. Looks like it's crossing right between 40 and 41. And halfway between there is 40.5 or 81 over 2. So you can double check yourself with these things. That's kind of a nice thing to do for yourself. Any other comments or thoughts on example D here? Let's try example F. No, actually, how about example E? Limit as, and this, this kind of got moved around somehow, so let me rewrite it. Limit as X approaches pi over 2 from the right of cosine of x over 1 minus sine of x all right so a hard thing to keep in mind is that we're coming at pi over 2 from the right that's going to be numbers that are bigger than pi over 2 so you're really coming in to pi over 2 in that direction Um, now, if I'm coming in from that direction, another thing to keep in mind is the whether or not cosine is positive or negative in the second quadrant. Cosine is negative. negative in the second quadrant. In fact, here's something I tell my my trigonometry students when we look at what's positive in all these quadrants. All your functions are positive in quadrant one. The functions that depend on just the y-coordinate, sine and its reciprocal, are positive in quadrant two. Tangent and cotangent have a positive ratio in quadrant three, and then cosine is positive in quadrant four, 
and my little mnemonic for them is all students take calculus, which I like. So, anyways, let's take a look at what's going to happen as you approach pi over 2 from the left. Well, um, oops. You're going to have to do a little thought experiment. As you're approaching pi over 2 from the left, you're going to have a negative value, but what's the the cosine value you're going to approach? Zero. And in the denominator, sine is getting closer and closer to the y coordinate here. And the y coordinate is 1. So what's this denominator getting close to? Zero. So not a surprise. One more time, you've got to use L'Hopital's rule. So if I use L'Hopital's rule here, let's see, who haven't I picked on in a while? Josie? What's this going to look like if I use L'Hopital's rule? It's going to be negative sine of x over... Negative sine of x over... Negative cosine of x. All right. You have sine of x over negative cosine of x. Okay. Um, now let's see what happens if I try and plug this in. The negatives cancel each other out, so that's fine. But, hmm. Now you're approaching from the, the positive side or the larger side of pi over 2, so you're in the second quadrant getting closer to this. Where's sine going? Sine's going to 1, and cosine's going to 0. 1 divided by 0, that's not a L'Hopital's rule anymore. 1 divided by 0 is going towards infinity. So let's actually take a look at the graph then. Does, that, does the graph kind of support that same idea here? So let's see. Well, we're coming close to pi over 2 um, from the positive side, so that's to the right here. Where does that graph look like it's going? And by the way, I, I, just, just for the ease of your vision, um, I restricted the graph to 0 to pi. We didn't need to look at the graph elsewhere. And I threw in this, this line here at x equal pi over 2. But where's our, where's our graph going? As you approach pi over 2 from the right, is it going to positive infinity or is it going to negative infinity? So there's pi over 2. Now approaching from the right, approaching from the positive side is here, that's going towards negative infinity. So that's the same conclusion that we're getting here, because here you're approaching um, negative 1 in the numerator, and you're approaching uh, positive 0 in the denominator, so negative divided by a positive is going to be negative. So this one's going to be negative infinity. But it's supported by the graph. We can just look at the graph and see, oh yeah, that makes sense. The one thing that I like to, like to stress is you've got to be coming in from the right. Because if you're coming in from the left, then you're going to have a different limit. All right, uh, a bunch of questions. I'm going to go from left to right. Uh, Kirillos? So when we got the negative 1 over 0, Yes. do we refer to the graph to see what the limit is from right after that? or? Um, you know, it, it, there's, there's nothing wrong with always being guided in your intuition by looking at the graph. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not going to take your graphing calculators away from you. 
So you should look at the graph. Um, I would. Uh, let me keep going. Drew, Drew's next. So how is negative one over zero? Well, it's it's not. Keep in mind what's going on as you get close to this. You're getting closer and closer to to the y coordinate of one. So because you got a negative out front here, you're going to get a negative of one. So that's where the numerator is getting close to. Now at the same time you're getting close to that, the denominator is getting really, really small because the denominator is the x coordinate of this point. And as you're getting close to this from this side, you're getting closer and closer to zero, right? So it's getting really, really small. So you're dividing something like one by something really small. So think about it and do a, a thought experiment this way. Divide one by one tenth, you get 10. Divide one by one hundredth, you get 100. One by a thousandth, 10,000, et cetera. So that quotient is getting really big, it's getting towards infinity. But if you keep track of the signs, cosine is negative in this quadrant, but I already have a negative here. So the negative of a negative is positive. Basically, the denominator is positive and the numerator is negative. That's why I get this negative quotient um, that is going towards negative infinity. If you switch to this side, then everything is going to be positive. Um, so you're going to end up going to positive infinity. There were some more hands up. Uh, Anthony. I couldn't quite hear that. Well, this, this is exactly, that is the tangent. Yeah. And so uh, essentially what you're looking at when you look at that graph um, is, is kind of a tangent looking graph. Um, it's not perfectly a tangent looking graph, uh, but it is similar to a tangent looking graph. And James. So like, let's say I were to like cancel out those negatives. Can I do that? Yeah, you can cancel out the negatives. Sure. And that would leave you with sine of x divided by cosine of x. And if you canceled out the negatives, then as you approach um, pi over 2 from the left, sine is still sine is going to be positive and cosine is going to be negative, in which case you still have a negative quotient. You'd have a positive divided by a negative. So it's still going to go to negative infinity. But one way or another, when you divide any constant by a number that's getting vanishingly small, that quotient's going to go to infinity. It's just a matter of the signs. Does it turn out to be positive infinity or negative infinity? Tina. Tony. Tony. Sorry, I'm sorry. Tony, yeah. Um, this just doesn't make sense to me. So like, Which part? Well, how uh, negative 1 divided by 0 equals negative infinity, but also my intuition is telling me, OK, that's tangent. Like, that's a positive tangent. And then I would have taken the derivative again. Ah, uh, but L'Hopital's rule doesn't apply at this point anymore, does it? Why not? Where's the numerator going? Zero over zero. zero. It has to be zero over zero to use L'Hopital's rule again, right? Yeah. And the numerator is going to one, the denominator is going to zero. But one divided by zero is not L'Hopital's rule. So you can't use that anymore in order to try and evaluate where this limit is going. Initially, that would have been considered undefined then, right? It's coming close to pi over 2. It's not coming yeah, to it's, zero. Yeah, that's, that's the thing about limits. You're getting <laughs> close to that value. You're not actually always getting to that value. Now, it's true that sometimes we use the idea that we can just plug in the limit and works. That that requires that you have a function that's continuous at that point. And this function is not continuous at that point. There's a vertical asymptote at that point. So that's why we can't plug it in initially, is because it's undefined. You end up with 0 over 0. That allowed us to use L'Hopital's rule the first time, but we can't use it again because this isn't of the form of L'Hopital's rule. It's 1 over 0. So I'm an exam. Is this the work you would want us to show, or would it be sufficient for us yeah. to just like plug it in the graph 
Uh, well, if, if I want a graph solution, I'll say justify your answer. If I want you to use L'Hopital's rule, I'll say, you know, show me some work, um, use L'Hopital's rule or something like that. But if you look carefully at my exams, sometimes I'll say justify the work or justify your answer. And if I do that, then, you know, one of the ways you could justify it would be with a table. Another way you could justify it would be with the graph. So there's, there's other ways you can justify your answer beyond just that. Now, one of the things you mentioned was that, you know, you, you were thinking about the graph, uh, you know, something divided by zero. Um, let's take a look at the, the simplest example of something divided by zero, which is one over x. When you divide um, by zero or when you divide by a value of x that's positive, your quotient is going to be positive and your, your limit's going to go towards infinity this way. But when you cross the uh, y-axis over here and you've got a negative value for x, now all of a sudden you've got something positive divided by something negative. That's going to give you a negative quotient. Either way, you're dividing something like 1 by something that's getting vanishingly small. So the quotient's going to be infinity. It's just, are you going to get there in a positive route or a negative route? I guess I forgot we're looking at it like as it's approaching. Cool. All right. Thanks for asking, though. And a lot of good questions on that. I really appreciate that. Uh, let's see. Now, there's some indeterminate powers that are kind of wild, too. And it's, it's fun to deal with these things. So... These are some indeterminate types, 0 to the 0, infinity to the 0, 1 to the infinity. It's always kind of an interesting battle. It's like, all right, you've got infinity, which is really, really big, but to the 0 power. And anything to 0 power is 1. Or how about 1, 1 to any power is 1, except 1 to the infinity? I mean, so it's, it's curious to see, well, well, what wins in all this stuff? So let's keep going on uh, with example G. Um, we're skipping example F. So example G. Mm -hmm. uh, so the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 minus 4x to the 1 over x. All right. Let's think about that one. Um, what's our first thing that we try? Plug in the limit. And if you plug in the limit, Plug in a zero here and a zero here. Wow. Well, we just kind of went over this just a minute ago. When you divide one by something getting vanishingly small, that's going to go to infinity or negative infinity. But let's just assume that this is maybe a positive zero. Um, you know, so you've got one to the infinity. What? What is that? I don't know. I mean, I really don't know. So. <sighs> this is of the form 1 to the infinity. It's not something you can use L'Hopital's rule for yet. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to call that limit y. Say, all right, well, y equals this. And I'm going to play with this a little bit until I can put it in the form of L'Hopital's rule. So. I'm then going to take the ln of both sides. Okay. And now I'm going to do a little bit of magic here. I'm going to interchange the order of the ln and the limit. So it's going to be the limit uh, as x approaches 0. You know, I'm not sure about this, but um, 
I think we're going to put a plus here from the positive side. I think this is going to have problems if that's not a positive. So I'm going to interchange this, and that's going to be the ln of 1 minus 4x to the 1 over x. And that doesn't necessarily really help me a lot by itself. But there is something I can do because I know my properties of logs. Caitlin? Bring down the 1 over x to the front. Perfect. So that becomes the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 over x ln of 1 minus 4x, which is the limit as x approaches 0 of the ln of 1 minus 4x over x. So basically, I just rewrote this product here as a quotient. So we don't care about the natural log of y because we're looking at... Well, we are going to have to go back and account for the fact that I took the natural log of both sides. I can't just take the natural log and call it a day because I've changed the problem here. Oh, but we're just but we're showing gonna... that it's going to be 0 over 0 or whatever. Ah, at this point... You've got the log of 1, which is 0, over 0. Oh, so you've, at this point, you've got 0 over 0. Maya, what's that tell me? If I end up with 0 over 0, what's that allowing me to do? Yeah. So you can use L'Hopital's rule. Nice, nice. Keep in mind, you're not using the quotient rule here. You're going to differentiate the numerator divided by the derivative of the denominator. So that's going to be the limit as x approaches 0. Let's start with the easy part. The derivative of the denominator is 1. But what happens when I differentiate this? So let me remind you here real quick, d by dx of the ln of u is 1 over u times the derivative of u. So that's the little gem that we need to keep in mind as we do this. So it's going to be 1. What's my u in this case? 1 over 1 minus 4x times the derivative of 1 minus 4x. That's not too bad. Okay. May help me differentiate 1 minus 4x. What would they give me? Negative 4. Negative 4. <clears throat> so overall, this sim uh, simplifies down to the limit as x approaches 0, <coughs> negative 4 over 1 minus 4x. Thanks, King. What's that limit? Can we just plug in the limit here? Yeah. Yeah. So we end up with negative 4. Beautiful. Ah, but now we got to go back and take care of Caitlin's concern. Caitlin was all upset because at the beginning of this problem, I took the logs. All right, it's a little... No, she was all upset. Oh, yeah. my gosh. <laughs> yeah. She was on Twitter telling all her friends, like, I can't believe we're taking the logs on this. It just doesn't work for me. All right. <laughs> so we get the ln of y equals negative 4. But I want the ln of y. Let me remind you. What's what base is understood to be here? Ten. Not ten. My bad. My bad. E. Wait, what did? Oh. Ln and log base e mean the same thing. You are so right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I want to rewrite this 
as an equivalent expression using exponents. So it looks like this. e to the negative 4 power equals y. Now e to the negative 4 power is going to be pretty small. All right, but it's not going to be 0. Let's look at the graph and see if the graph actually bears this out. So the last step of this is to rewrite this using exponents. You know, another way to think of that, if you wanted to, you could do um, e to the ln of y equals e to the negative 4, and then these two things cancel each other out. That's a different way to get at the same conclusion, which is this right here. But let's look at the graph. So yeah, that's down to here. Boy, if you don't look at this really closely, what does it look like the limit is? I mean, if you're just following the graph, oh, the limit is zero. But if you zoom in enough, you see that the graph crosses above zero, doesn't it? It's undefined right at zero. That's okay. We want to look at the limit as x approaches zero. So the limit from the left, the limit from the right. Eh, okay, getting close to some number, which you know I couldn't do off the top of my head, but we can check it this way. One, or how about just e raised to the negative four power? Oh, about 1.83 or 0.0183. So, great. So, the graphs are, are wonderful if you're using them correctly. Um, you can't completely rely on this because a quick glance at that graph would suggest that it's going to zero. But it's not. It's beautiful. I have a question. I got an answer. What's up? So, so we took the derivative of the, of the natural log of that uh, whole expression. Why didn't we take the derivative of the left side where it was L and Y? Because we're, the derivative, well, we didn't exactly take the derivative of, of this whole expression. Um, we applied L'Hopital's rule to a limit. So let me pull this up here. Um, the only time we did the derivative is in evaluating the limit. We weren't evaluating a limit over here. Okay. We had a, a limit here, and that's where we applied L'Hopital's rule. So it's the derivative of the numerator divided by the derivative of the denominator. Um, and that eventually led us to a limit of negative 4 for the log of this. And then we had to unlog it because Caitlin was really concerned. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> really convenient. What's that? This whole thing is just really convenient, like the way it works. All right, it's, it worked out great, you know, but it's, um, you know, we, yeah. the, reason, the reason we had to take logs is so that we could get it in a form that we could use L'Hopital's rule for. So that's why we had to take logs. Because yeah. having, you know, one to the infinity power um, is not in the form of L'Hopital's rule. So we couldn't use L'Hopital's rule here. So... Any other comments or questions on that one? All right, all right. Um, mm -hmm. Let's do one last example. That'd be example I. So this one's kind of a, a bizarre one. And we can look at uh, the graph here. Example I. And example I is asking us for the limit as you know what as a typo on the typo on this it should say the limit as x approaches zero um for example i not the limit as x approaches infinity <clears throat> limit as x approaches zero of x times sine of seven pi over x what's the graph telling you that limit is Graph. What's the graph suggesting? I mean, it, it gets really busy in there, but let me make it a little bit more 
clear this way. Let's look, let's put in two graphs, y equals x and y equals negative x. Uh, and I'll put these two in the same color purple. But I mean this this graph eventually has to funnel down to zero, right? I mean it's stuck between these two other graphs. This is your sandwich theorem from earlier in the course. This function is squeezing, um, is being squeezed out by the graphs of x and negative x. So it looks like it's going to zero, but how do you prove that? Because right now when you look at this, you've got zero times, wow, something really crazy. Seven divided by, seven pi divided by zero. Um, well, let's see, what can we do here? Right now, if you try plugging in the limit, you would get uh, zero times the sine of infinity, maybe. I don't know, tough to say. So, once again, you're going to have to rewrite this. Limit as x approaches zero, x sine of 7 pi over x. And the way I'm going to rewrite it this time, is this limit as x approaches zero of, you know, actually, you know what? Can you just do? I lied. This is going towards infinity. This, it was right. Sorry. But at this point, you know, assuming we're going to infinity, um, then what do we get when we try and plug this in? You get infinity times the sine of zero. So you have infinity times zero. You know, what is that? Don't know. So I'm going to rewrite it. I'm going to leave the sine of 7 pi over x here. And as x approaches infinity, 7 pi divided by infinity is going to go to 0. Sine of 0 is going to be 0. So I get a 0 in the numerator. Over here in the denominator, I'm going to write divided by 1 over x. Now what happens when you divide by a fraction? What's the rule? Multiply by the reciprocal. Multiply by the reciprocal. Thank you. And if you multiply by the reciprocal, that's going to give you an x, x times the numerator. So these two things are the same. But what have I accomplished in going from here to here? You need a division problem. I got a division problem. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, as x approaches infinity, this is going to go to zero. As x approaches infinity, this is going to go to zero, and the sine of zero is zero. So, wow, all of a sudden that's L'Hopital's rule. So, use L'Hopital's rule. Now, this is going to be a little bit more challenging than our previous one. That's okay. Let me maybe rewrite it this way first. Limit as x approaches 0 of uh, the sine of 7 pi x to the negative first over x to the negative first. Infinity, thank you. Why do you suppose I did that? If you differentiate the denominator in this form, how would you have to find the derivative? Quotient, Quotient rule. Doing it here, a little bit easier, right? It's just going to be negative x to the negative second, right? So this is just a power now, uh, using the power rule as opposed to the quotient rule. And similar kind of thing in the numerator. I don't have to differentiate the inside of this using the quotient rule. 
you do have to use the chain rule. Limit as x approaches infinity. Give it a shot. If you're watching this later, then you know, pause video and try and do it yourself. Unpause when I lift this up. Remember, it's going to be drew to the outside times drew to the inside. And the denominator is just going to be negative x to the negative second. <clears throat> better that we can do with that. Um, but you're right, we want to simplify it. Okay, so let's think. When we differentiate this, it's the derivative of the outside, which is going to be your cosine of 7 pi x negative first, derivative of the outside of the inside times the derivative of the inside. So the derivative of the inside, what's that going to be? Well, it's going to be really the derivative of this, right? Which is going to bring negative out front, negative 7 pi x to the negative second. You're still taking the limits here. But there's something nice that happens as a result of this. Does anyone see it? What can I simplify? Oh. x to the negative second cancels in both the numerator and denominator, right? Bam, hasta vista, they're gone. You've got a product here. One of your products, one of the factors is x to negative 2. That cancels. The negative cancels as well. So that cancels. And that leaves you with a 7 pi. I'm going to take the 7 pi all the way out front. So it's going to be 7 pi times uh, the limit as x approaches infinity of the cosine of 7 pi x to the negative first. Now this might be a little bit um, challenging for you to, to work with in your head. So let me rewrite that one last time. Limit as x approaches infinity of the cosine of 7 pi over x. And that should pretty much do it for us. Let's think about this limit. Cosine is a nice continuous function, so I'll interchange these 
And basically, I'll take the cosine of the limit as x approaches infinity of 7 pi over x. What's that limit going to be? 0. Yeah. And what's a cosine of 0? 1. So we end up with 7 pi for our limit. Now what about that kind of makes sense? Hmm. Well, 7 pi is going to be pretty close to 22 if my arithmetic is any good. Um, how can I kind of confirm that in another way? The graph. So the graph is getting close to 22, 7 pi. And you can see that it has some kind of an asymptote, that it's hitting some kind of a ceiling there. So if you looked at the graph, 7 pi is a good candidate. In fact, it kind of confirms what we're seeing based on the calculus here. So let's, uh, let's see. I have that one. That was example I, wasn't it? Yeah, there we go. Let's shut this one. No. Um, we just need to look at this in a little wider frame of reference. Um, yeah, here we go. So the limit does kind of taper off a little bit. I can get rid of that and maybe replace it with 7 pi. 7 pi. There you go. Looks good. And the farther out you go, the closer that red line will get to the purple line. It'll never quite touch it, but it'll get very, very close. Comments or thoughts on that last one? So I have a question. Yeah, please. In general, um, so whenever we have like one of the intermediate powers, one of those three, we want to get it in the form of zero over zero or infinity over. Infinity. Yes. Okay. So the the take home rule. The take-home point about this problem is that if it's not in the form for L'Hopital's rule, then you want to put it in that form. So one way or another, you're going to have to manipulate the problem. So I showed you a couple different ways you could do that. In this case, if you have an exponent, you might want to try taking logs. If you have a product, then maybe you can rearrange it by dividing by the reciprocal like we did there. So those are a couple different ideas on ways to rearrange it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Tony. Um, I wanted to count on that little trick you did. Can you pull your finger down a little bit? This one? Right no, here? it's like lower. So you took the limit of what was... I interchange those? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can do that? If you have a continuous function, yes. Oh, I never seen that. Okay. Anything else? Uh, I, I just, I'm just trying to really show that you end up with the cosine of zero here. So, I mean, you, you can, if you can see that here, great. You don't need to. You can just say, oh, that's the cosine of zero, and that's going to be seven pi. You know, you don't have to. I was just trying to be very emphatic about where that came from. So I didn't want to leave it. No student left behind. All right. Let's take a break.